Winter Night by K. Boyle. There is a time of apprehension which begins with the beginning of darkness and to which only the speech of love can lend security. It is there in abeyance at the end of every day, not urgent enough to be given the name of fear, but rather of concern for how the hours are to be reprieved from fear. And those who have forgotten how it was when they were children can remember nothing of this. It may begin around five o'clock on a winter afternoon when the light outside is dying in the windows. At the hour, the New York apartment in which Felicia lived was filled with shadows and the little girl would wait alone in the living room, looking out at the winter stripped trees that stood black in the park against the isolated ovals of unclean snow. Now, it was January, and the day had been a cold one. The water of the artificial lake was frozen fast, but because of the cold and the coming darkness, the skaters had ceased to move across its surface. The street that lay between the park and the apartment house was wide, and the two-way streams of cars and buses, some with their headlamps already shining, advanced and halted, halted, and poured swiftly on the tempo of the traffic signal's altering lights. The time of apprehension had set in, and Felicia, who was seven, stood at the window in the evening and waited before she asked the question, when the signals below would change from red to green again, or when the double-decker bus would turn the corner below, she would ask it, the words of it were already there, tentative in her mouth, when the answer came from the far end of the hall. Your mother, said the voice among the sounds of kitchen things. She telephoned up before you came in from nursery school. She won't be back in time for supper. I was to tell you a sitter was coming in from the sitting parent's place. Felicia turned back from the window into the obscurity of the living room, and she looked toward the open door and into the hall beyond it, where the light from the kitchen fell in a clear yellow angle across the wall and onto the strip of carpet. Her hands were cold, and she put them in her jacket pockets as she walked carefully across the living room rug and stopped at the edge of light. Will she be home late? She said. For a moment, there was the sound of water running in the kitchen, a long way away, and then the sound of the water ceased, and the high southern voice went on. She come home when she gets ready to come home. That's all I have to say. If she wants to spend $2.50 and 10 cents cow fare on top of that three or four nights out of the week for a sitting parent to come in here and sit, it's her own business. It certainly ain't nothing to do with you or me. She makes her money just like the rest of us does. She works all day down there in that office, whatever it is, just like the rest of us works. And she's entitled to spend her money like she wants to spend it. There's no law in the world against buying your own freedom. Your mother and me, we're just buying our own freedom. That's all we're doing. And we're not doing nobody no harm. Do you know who she's having supper with? said Felicia from the edge of dark. There was one more step to take, and then she would be standing in the light that fell on the strip of carpet. But she did not take the step. Do I know who she's having supper with? The voice cried out in what might have been derision. And there was the sound of dishes striking the metal ribs of the drain board by the sink. Maybe it's with Mr. Van Johnson or Mr. Frank Sinatra. Or maybe it's just the Duke of Winces for the evening. All I know is you're having soft-boiled egg and spinach and applesauce for supper, and you're going to have it quick now, because the time is getting away. The voice from the kitchen had no name. It was as variable as the faces and figures of the women who came and sat in the evenings. Month by month, the voice in the kitchen altered to another voice, and the sitting parents were no more 
lonely aunts of an evening or two who sometimes returned and sometimes did not to this apartment in which they had sat before. Nobody stayed anywhere very long anymore. Felicia's mother told her, it was part of the time in which you lived and part of the life of the city. But when the fathers came back, all this would be miraculously changed. Perhaps you would live in a house again, a small one, with fir trees on the other side of a short brick wall, and father would drive up every night from the station just after darkness set in. When Felicia thought of this, she stepped quickly into the clear angle of the light, and she left the dark of the living room behind her and ran softly down the hall. The drop-leaf table stood in the kitchen between the refrigerator and the sink, and Felicia sat down at the place that was set. The voice at the sink was speaking still, and while Felicia ate, it did not cease to speak, until the bell of the front door rang abruptly. The girl walked around the table and went down the hall, wiping her dark palms in her apron, and from the drop-leaf table, Felicia watched her step from the angle of light into darkness and open the door. You put in an early appearance, the girl said, and the woman who had rung the bell came into the hall. The door closed behind her and the girl showed her into the living room and lit the lamp on the bookcase and the shadows were suddenly bleached away. But when the girl turned, the woman turned from the living room too and followed her humbly and in silence to the threshold of the kitchen. Sometimes they keep me standing around waiting after it's time for me to be getting on home, the sitting parents do, the girl said, and she picked up the last two dishes from the table and put them in the sink. The woman stood in the doorway, was a small woman, and when she undid the white silk scarf from around her head, Felicia saw her hair was black. She wore it parted in the middle, and it had not been cut but was drawn back loosely into a knot behind her head. She had very clean white gloves on, and her face was pale, and there was a look of sorrow in her soft black eyes. Sometimes I have to stand out there in the hall with my hat and coat on waiting for the sitting parents to turn up, the girl said, and as she turned on the water in the sink, the contempt she had for them hung on in the kitchen air. But you're ahead of time, she said, and she held the dishes first one and then the other under the flow of steaming water. The woman in the doorway wore a neat black coat, not a new looking coat, and it had no fur on it, but it had a smooth velvet collar and velvet lapels. She did not move or smile, and she gave no sign that she had heard the girl speaking above the sound of water at the sink. She simply stood looking at Felicia, who sat at the table with the milk in her glass, not finished yet. Are you the child? She said at last, and her voice was low and the pronunciation of the words a little strange. Yes, this here's Felicia, the girl said, and the dark hands dried the dishes and put them away. You drink up your milk quick now, Felicia, so I can rinse your glass. I will wash the glass, said the woman. I would like to wash the glass for her. And Felicia sat looking across the table at the face in the doorway that was filled with such unspoken grief. I will wash the glass for her and clean off the table, the woman was saying quietly. When the child is finished, she will show me where her night things are. The others, they wouldn't do anything like that, the girl said, and she hung the dishcloth over the rack. They wouldn't put their hands to housework. The sitting parents... That's where they got the name for them, she said. Whenever the front door closed behind the girl in the evening, it would usually be that sitting parent who was there would take up a book of fairy stories and read aloud for a while to Felicia, or else would settle herself in the big chair in the living room and begin to tell the words of a story in drowsiness to her, while Felicia took off her clothes in the bedroom and folded them and put her pajamas on and brushed her teeth and did her hair. But this time, that was not the way it happened. Instead, the woman sat down on the other chair at the kitchen table and she began at once to speak. 
not of good fairies or bad or animals endowed with human speech, but to speak quietly in spite of the eagerness behind her words of a thing that seemed of singular importance to her. It is strange that I should have been sent here tonight, she said, her eyes moving slowly from feature to feature of Felicia's face, for you look like a child that I knew once, and this is the anniversary of that child. Did she have hair like mine? Felicia asked quickly, and she did not keep her eyes fixed on the unfinished glass of milk in the shyness anymore. Yes, she did. She had hair like yours, said the woman, and her glance paused for a moment on the locks which fell straight and thick on the shoulder of Felicia's dress. It may have been that she thought to stretch out her hand and touch the ends of Felicia's hair, for her fingers stirred as they lay clasped together on the table, and then they relapsed into passivity again. But it is not the hair alone. It is the delicacy of your face, too, and your eyes, the same, filled with the same spring lilac color, the woman said, pronouncing the words carefully. She had little coats of golden fur on her arms and legs, she said, and when we were closed up there, the lot of us in the cold, I used to make her laugh when I told her that the fur that was so pretty, like a little fawn skin on her arms, would always help to keep her warm. And did it keep her warm? asked Felicia. And she gave a little jerk of laughter as she looked down at her own legs, hanging under the table with the bare calves thin and covered with a down of hair. It did not keep her warm enough the woman said, and now the mask of grief had come back upon her face. So we used to take everything we could spare from ourselves, and we would sew them into cloaks and other kinds of garments for her and for the other children. Was it a school? said Felicia when the woman's voice had ceased to speak. No, said the woman softly. It was not a school. But still, there were a lot of children there, it was a camp. That was the name the place had. It was a camp. It was a place where they put people until they could decide what was to be done with them. She sat with her hands clasped, silent a moment, looking at Felicia. That little dress you have on, she said, not saying the words to anybody, scarcely saying them aloud. Oh, she would have liked that little dress the little buttons shaped like hearts, and the white collar. I have four school dresses, Felicia said. I'll show them to you. How many dresses did she have? Well, there, you see, there in the camp, said the woman. She did not have any dresses except the little skirt and the pullover. That was all she had. She had brought just a handkerchief of her belongings with her, like everybody else, just enough for three days away from home, was what they told us, so she did not have enough to last the winter. But she had her ballet slippers, the woman said, and her clasped fingers did not move. She'd brought them because she thought during her three days away from home she would have time to practice her ballet. I've been, been to the ballet, Felicia said suddenly, and she said it so eagerly that she stuttered a little as the words came out of her mouth. She slipped quickly down from the chair and went around the table to where the woman sat. There she took one of the woman's hands away from the other that held it fast, and she pulled her toward the door. Come into the living room, and I'll do a pirouette for you, she said, and then she stopped speaking. Her eyes halted on the woman's face. Did she, did the little girl, could she do a pirouette very well? She said. Yes, she could. At first she could, said the woman. And Felicia felt uneasy now at the sound of sorrow in her words. But after that, she was hungry. She was hungry all winter, she said in a low voice. We were all hungry but the children were the hungriest. Even now, 
she said, and her voice went suddenly savage. When I see milk like that, clean, fresh milk standing in a glass, I want to cry out loud. I want to beat my hands on the table because it did not have to be. She had drawn her fingers abruptly away from Felicia now, and Felicia stood before her, cast off, forlorn, alone again in the time of apprehension. That was three years ago, the woman was saying, and one hand was lifted as in weariness to shade her face. It was somewhere else. It was in another country, she said, and behind her hand, her eyes were turned upon the substance of a world in which Felicia had played no part. Did, did the little girl cry when she was hungry? Felicia asked, and the woman shook her head. Sometimes she cried, she said, but not very much. She was very quiet. One night, when she heard the other children crying, she said to me, You know, they are not crying because they want something to eat. They are crying because their mothers have gone away. Did the mothers have to go out to supper? Felicia asked, and she watched the woman's face for the answer. No, said the woman. She stood up from her chair, and now that she had put her hand on the little girl's shoulder, Felicia was taken into the sphere of love and intimacy again. Shall we go into the other room and you will do your pirouette for me, the woman said. And they went from the kitchen and down the strip of carpet on which the clear light fell. In the front room, they paused hand in hand in the glow of the shaded lamp. And the woman looked about her at the books, the low table and the magazines and ashtrays on them, the vase of roses on the piano, looking with dark, scarcely seeing eyes at these things that had no reality at all. It was only when she saw the little white clock on the mantelpiece that she gave any sign. And then she said quickly, what time does your mother put you to bed? Felicia waited a moment, and in the interval of waiting, the woman lifted one hand and, as if in reverence, touched Felicia's hair. What time did the little girl you knew in the other place go to bed? Felicia asked. Oh, I do not know. I do not remember, the woman said. Was she your little girl? said Felicia softly, stubbornly. No, said the woman. She was not mine. At least, at first, she was not mine. She had a mother, a real mother, but the mother had to go away. Did she come back late? asked Felicia. No, no, she could not come back. She never came back, the woman said. And now she turned her arm around Felicia's shoulder and sat down in the low, soft chair. Why am I saying all this to you? Why am I doing it? She cried out in grief, and she held Felicia close against her. I had thought to speak of the anniversary to you, and that was all. And now I am saying these things to you. Three years ago today, exactly, the little girl became my little girl because her mother went away. That is all there is to it. There is nothing more. Felicia wanted another moment, held close against the woman and listening to the swift, strong heartbeats in the woman's breast. But the mother, she said then, in the small, persistent voice, did she take a taxi when she went? This is the way it used to happen, said the woman, speaking in hopelessness and bitterness in the softly lighted room. Every week they used to come into the place where we were, and they would read a list of names out. Sometimes it would be the names of children they would read out, and then a little later they would have to go away. And sometimes it would be the grown people's names, the names of the mothers or big sisters or other women's names. The men were not with us. The fathers were somewhere else in another place. Yes, Felicia said. I know. We had been there only a little while, maybe ten days or maybe not so long, the woman went on, holding Felicia against her still. When they read the name of the little girl's mother out, and that afternoon they took her away. What did the little girl do? 
Felicia said. She wanted to think up the best way of getting out so that she could go find her mother, said the woman, but she could not think of anything good enough until the third or fourth day, and then she tied her ballet slippers up in a handkerchief again, and she went up to the guard standing at the door. The woman's voice was gentle, controlled now. She asked the guard please to open the door so that she could go out. This is Thursday, she said, and every Tuesday and Thursday I have my ballet lessons. If I miss a ballet lesson, they do not count the money off. So my mother would be just paying for nothing, and she cannot afford to pay for nothing. I missed my ballet lesson on Tuesday, she said to the guard, and I must not miss it again today. Felicia lifted her head from the woman's shoulder, and she shook her hair back and looked in question and wondered at the woman's face. And did the man let her go? She said, no, he did not. He could not do that, said the woman. He was a soldier, and he had to do what he was told. So every evening after her mother went, I used to brush the little girl's hair for her. The woman went on saying, and while I brushed it, I used to tell her the stories of the ballets. Sometimes I would begin with Narcissus, the woman said, and she parted Felicia's locks with her fingers. So if you will go and get your brush now, I will tell it while I brush your hair. Oh, yes, said Felicia, and she made two whirls as she went quickly to the bedroom. On the way back, she stopped and held on to the piano with the fingers of one hand while she went up on her toes. Did you see me? Did you see me standing on my toes? She called the woman, and the woman sat smiling in love and contentment at her. Yes, wonderful, really wonderful, she said. I am sure I have never seen anyone do it so well. Felicia came spinning toward her, whirling in pirouette after pirouette, and she flung herself down in the chair close to her, with her thin bones pressed against the woman's soft white hips. The woman took the silver-backed monogrammed brush and the tortoise-shell comb in her hands, and now she began to brush Felicia's hair. We did not have any soap at all, and not very much water to wash in, so I never could fix her as nicely and prettily as I wanted to, she said and the brush stroked regularly, carefully down, caressing the shape of Felicia's head. If there wasn't very much water, then how did she do her teeth, Felicia said. She did not do her teeth, said the woman, and she drew the comb through Felicia's hair. There were not any toothbrushes or toothpaste or anything like that. Felicia waited a moment constructing the unfamiliar scene of it in silence. And then she asked the tentative question, Do I have to brush my teeth tonight? She said. No, said the woman. And she was thinking of something else. You do not have to do your teeth. If I am your little girl tonight, can I pretend there isn't enough water to wash? Said Felicia. Yes, said the woman. You can pretend that if you like. You do not have to wash, she said, and the comb passed lightly through Felicia's hair. Will you tell me the story of the ballet, said Felicia, and the rhythm of the brushing was like the soft, slow rocking of sleep. Yes, said the woman. In the first one, the place is a forest glade with little pale birches growing in it and they have green veils over their faces and green veils drifting from their fingers because it is the springtime. There is the music of a flute, said the woman's voice softly, softly, and creatures of the wood are dancing. But the mother, Felicia said as suddenly as if she had been awakened from sleep, what did the little girl's mother say when she didn't do her teeth and didn't wash at night? The mother was not there, you remember, said the woman, and the brush moved steadily in her hand. But she did send one little letter back, 
Sometimes the people who went away were able to do that. The mother rode it in a train, standing up in a car that had no seats. She said, and she might have been telling the story of the ballet still, for her voice was gentle and the brush did not falter on Felicia's hair. There were perhaps a great many other people standing up in the train with her, perhaps all trying to write their little letters on the bits of paper they had managed to hide on them or that they had found in forgotten corners as they traveled. When they had written their letters, then they must try to slip them out through the boards of the car in which they journeyed, standing up, said the woman. And these letters fell down on the tracks under the train, or they were blown into the fields or onto the country roads. And if it was a kind person who picked them up, he would seal them in an envelope and send them to where they were addressed to go. So a letter came back like this from the little girl's mother, the woman said, and the brush followed the comb, the comb, the brush, in steady pursuit through Felicia's hair. It said goodbye to the little girl, and it said, please to take care of her. It said, whoever reads this letter in the camp, please take good care of my little girl for me, and please have her tonsils looked at by a doctor if this is possible to do. And then, said Felicia softly, persistently, what happened to the little girl? I do not know. I cannot say, the woman said, but now the brush and comb had ceased to move, and in the silence Felicia turned her thin, small body on the chair, and she and the woman suddenly put their arms around each other. They must all be asleep now, all of them, the woman said, and in the silence that fell on them again, they held each other closer, they must be quietly asleep somewhere and not crying all night because they are hungry and because they are cold. For three years I have been saying they must all be asleep and the cold and the hunger and the seasons or night or day or nothing matters to them. It was after midnight when Felicia's mother put her key in the lock of the front door and pushed it open and stepped into the hallway. She walked quickly to the living room, and just across the threshold, she slipped the three blue fox skins from her shoulders and dropped them with her little velvet bag upon the chair. The room was quiet, so quiet that she could hear the sound of breathing in it, and no one spoke to her in greeting as she crossed towards the bedroom door. And then, as startling as a slap across her delicately tinted face, she saw the woman lying sleeping on the divan and Felicia in her school dress still, asleep within the woman's arms.